Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you are the God of, of all the nations. We thank you that you are living and, and active and that you are at work in this, this world, even as you were at work in the days of, of Jesus and the apostles. And Lord, we do pray that as we consider the Gospel of Matthew tonight, that you would be uh, your word would be powerfully at work in our hearts and lives. We pray that you would uh, yeah, show us who Jesus is, the, the suffering servant and the divine king, that we might go out uh, indeed to make disciples of, of all the nations. So be with us, we pray. Help me to teach faithfully, help us all uh, to learn well this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, yes, we're coming now to the, the Gospel of Matthew. We've finished uh, the book of Mark. And it's going to, uh, what we're going to do tonight is it's, a, it's an overview of Matthew's Gospel. Uh, and we're going to do a couple of things. Uh, first, we're going to step back and we're going to look at all the introductory issues and so on about, uh, you know, authorship and dating and, uh, you know, the structure of it, the purpose, all that kind of stuff. Uh, then we're going to think about some of the major themes in, in, in Matthew and, and the characteristics, and then we're going to do an overview. But I warn you, it's going to be very, very brief, right? Because uh, please don't be expecting that we're going to be going through Matthew's gospel like we did uh, with Mark. Uh, we've just got one session, and so the aim is going to be to really get the big picture, uh, to focus on what's unique, what's uh, different, what's special about the gospel of Matthew. And uh, so that's the first part. The second lecture this evening, we're, we'll, we're going to focus ourselves on the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five to seven. We're going to do that in a whole lot more detail. Okay, so let's let's get started then. Uh, and the first issue we have then is the issue of authorship. Who wrote the Gospel of Matthew? Uh, and of course, the answer is it was written by uh, Matthew. Matthew, the apostle. Uh, one of the 12. Uh, now, of course, formally, it's, uh, it's, an anon it's anonymous, uh, but there are good reasons for thinking that it was Matthew, the tax collector, who, who, who wrote it. Now, uh, this, uh, this Matthew, he is, uh, he's called a tax collector in Matthew's gospel itself. Uh, Matthew 10, verse 3, in the list of the apostles. Uh, Matthew 10, verse 3, he's named as uh, Matthew, the tax collector. And it's very likely that this is the same uh, character who's called uh, Levi uh, in, in Mark chapter 2. So in Mark chapter 2, if you remember, we met Levi, the tax collector. Jesus passed by it, called him to, to follow him. And uh, the same story is, is, is recorded in, uh, in, in, Matthew as, uh, in Matthew as well, Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. And uh, in that in that parallel uh, passage, he's called Matthew, Matthew the text collector. So uh, he's the one who who wrote it. It's likely that Matthew and Levi are alternate names for the same person. It was a common thing in those days. Think of Simon, who was also called Peter, or Saul, who was also called Paul. You've got Abram, Abraham in the Old Testament, Jacob in Israel, uh, etc. It's possible that that uh, Levi is his tribe, but that's actually very unlikely. Um, it's more likely that he just had two, uh, two names. So how do we know that Matthew wrote it? Well, the first evidence is, is actually the title itself. And if you go to the beginning of any of the Gospels, they will have this title on them, uh, uh, usually something like the Gospel according to Matthew. Um, all the manuscripts have, have this title to it. Uh, and these titles, Gospel according to Matthew, Gospel according to Mark, and so on, uh, they're added so early to the manuscripts that we have no evidence that uh, that uh, that the gospels ever circulated without these titles. I mean, they, they they may have originally not been there, but in all the manuscripts we have, it always has the title, the Gospel according to Matthew, and so on. Uh, and, and so this is what Carson writes: the unanimity of the attributions in the second century cannot be explained by anything other than the assumption that the titles were part of the works from the beginning. Uh, and so in that sense, if that was really the case, that they always had these titles, then they're not formally anonymous, really. Um, uh, now, there's a guy called Papias who was in the early church. He's quoted by Eusebius, and uh, he affirms uh, that Matthew 
wrote the gospel to. He, uh, Pius is writing in 125 uh, AD. And, uh, and it's quite likely that this Papias actually knew the Apostle John uh, permanent, uh, personally. Uh, the uh, early church father Irenaeus says that Papias and also Polycarp, they both knew uh, John the Apostle personally. Uh, and so that's, that's one reason to, uh, uh, to trust him. But Papias uh, actually says that Matthew originally wrote his gospel in Hebrew, and then it was later translated into Greek. But most people, uh, most scholars today think the evidence for that is very weak. Um, there's actually serious problems with, with thinking that Matthew wrote it in Hebrew and then translated it into Greek. Um, so, for example, uh, the various citations from the Old Testament uh you, you, they suggest that the author is writing in Greek, but he also knows languages like Hebrew and Aramaic. Um, the fact that Matthew is depending so much on Mark, remember he's reproducing so much of Mark's gospel, it's highly unlikely that he wrote the whole thing in Hebrew because, of course, Mark wrote his gospel in Greek. So it's it's highly likely that, uh, that Matthew is doing the same because Matthew is so similar to Mark in, in terms of its Greek. Um, and of course, as you read the Gospel of Matthew, it doesn't sound like a translation. It sounds like, uh, if you read it in Greek, it sounds like it's very good Greek, not translated Greek. So Carson gives this uh, gives this summary. In short, the argument that Matthew was understood to be the author of the first Gospel uh, long before Papias wrote his difficult words affirming such a connection seems very strong, if not unassailable. Right. In other words, we're very very certain. Um, that Matthew, also known as Levi, wrote um, the Gospel of Matthew. So let's move on uh, and think of the next one, the Providence. So Providence is, uh, you know, what's the situation in which it was uh, written? And sometimes it's asserted that the Gospel of Matthew is a product of a community, not just one individual. Um, but those arguments are not so widespread today. The early church believed that the Gospel of Matthew uh, was probably written in Palestine itself, you know, in, in, in Israel, right? Uh, and there's a few reasons for that. Uh, firstly, there's a whole lot of untranslated Aramaic words that you will find in the Gospel of Matthew. So, for example, if you go Matthew 5.22, uh, I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Uh, whoever insults, and there's a the, the literal word there is raka. Um, whoever says raka to his brothers will be liable to the council. Right? Uh, so uh, it's translated into English for us, but it's it's not translated uh, in the Greek manuscript. It just says raka. Uh, similar in chapter 6, verse 24. Uh, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one, love the other. He will devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. As money is our trend, English translation, the Greek is uh, mammon, which is, a, uh, which is an Aramaic word. Or in chapter 27, verse 46, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lemes sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, that's, that's Aramaic. So uh, the assumption it, because these words aren't translated, it, I guess it assumes that the reader is familiar with what these uh, what these words mean. Um, now, uh, Jerome, who was an early first century, well, who was an early father, um, the one who composed the Latin Vulgate later on, uh, uh, he suggested that the Gospel of Matthew was written in Judea itself, um, and. It's certainly, as you read the Gospel of Matthew, it's one of the most Jewish Gospels, isn't it? Uh, Matthew is a Jew. He seems to be writing for a Jewish context. He seems to be writing in quite a Jewish way. Um, and so it makes sense if he's writing around Judea. That was, that was the first century's, that was the early church's view. Now, most scholars today, they don't think uh, it was written in, uh, in Palestine. They think it was probably written in Caesarea, and the prime candidate is the place called Antioch. Uh, a, a scholar named Streeter argued for that. And it is a natural candidate because Antioch in the north, it, it had a sizable Jewish community, uh, many of whom fled Jerusalem during the persecution, and it was uh, a favorable place to, to, towards the Gentile mission. Uh, that's where 
Paul and Barnabas were in the church and then they and, and, and were sent out on their missionary journeys. They left from Antioch. Uh, so early church fathers, they speculate both ways, perhaps Judea, perhaps uh, Antioch, Syria. But in the end, we don't really know. And it's probably not that important, right? So let's just move on. Next question is the dating. When was Matthew written? Uh, of course, again, we can't know for, sh for sure. There's essentially two main views here. There's the early dating. This was the early church's view. And then there's a later dating, which is the modern consensus. I'm going to argue for the early date here. Um, but partly it depends on which uh, gospel you think was written first, isn't it? Um, remember, the early church thought that Matthew was written first. So it's natural then that they would give an early dating to Matthew, isn't it? Um, but we've argued in this course, it's much more likely that Mark was written first. Um, and so if we're dating Mark somewhere between 55 and 70, then Matthew has to be after that because he's using stuff from Mark, right? Uh, another question on the dating is, is it written before the destruction of the temple in AD 70 or after the destruction of the temple? Now, some people think, oh, it must be after because uh, essentially they don't believe in prophecies. So uh, Jesus predicts in uh, in Matthew 13, and then you find that in the parallel in, in Mark 24, Matthew 24, that uh, it predicts the destruction of, of Jerusalem. But we believe that Jesus could prophesy the future and so on. So there's no reason why we shouldn't take it uh, that it, it, it was written beforehand. In fact, there are quite a lot of references in Matthew that are a bit hard to explain if the temple is not still standing. So, for example, if we went to Matthew 5, 23 again, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Now, that would be a strange thing to write if there was no more altar, there was no more temple, isn't it? If the temple was already uh, destroyed and we, there, there are other examples like that in in, in Matthew's uh, Matthew's gospel the, probably the most prominent one is the temple tax that you find in chapter 17 uh, they ask does your teacher not pay the tax right? and uh, so it's it's hard to imagine why Matthew would have retained this story about the temple tax if uh, if the temple was no longer there and there was no more tax, right? Um, another argument for an early date is that Matthew doesn't seem to be very dependent on Paul. Uh, and so you expect, because Paul was such a prominent figure in the early church, that if he knew about Paul, then uh, he would be shaped by Paul's, uh, Paul's theology too, right? So, uh, so although the early church is quite unanimous in giving the early date, um, uh, and most scholars today will give the later date, uh, it's probably best to accept the early date, I, I would say. Uh, so if you put Mark in the mid 50s, um, then perhaps the early 60s could be your dating for, for Matthew's gospel. And that's the conclusion that Carson comes to in the readings. He says, on balance, then the preponderance of evidence suggests Matthew was published before 70, but not long before. Okay, so let's go on to the next thing, which is the purpose. Why did Matthew write his book? Now, this one's uh, probably is, is, is more important. Now, it's not always easy to pin down someone's purpose because they don't always say it, is it? Now, we know that in some of the Gospels, they do that. Uh, you know, we've seen in John's Gospel, John 20, 30, uh, 30 to 31, he explicitly tells us his purpose, right? This is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, and, you know, Mark has his little headline statement, beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Um, but, you know, Matthew doesn't really do that, right? Uh, he doesn't tell you directly what his purpose is. So you kind of need to read it carefully, read between the lines, observe what he focuses on, um, and then work out from what he includes and what he doesn't, what his, what his focus is, what his, what his purpose is. Now, as you do that, uh, of course, you notice that Matthew is very Jewish in its, in its flavor, right? He seems to be interested in persuading Jews that Jesus is the promised Messiah of, of the Jews. And, and surely that's reflected in how he begins his gospel, isn't it? It's, 
It's such a Jewish way to begin. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, and that, uh, that book, that word genealogy there, it's literally the word uh, Genesis, which ought, ought to recall Genesis 1, Genesis 1 for us. Uh, and then he's got this long genealogy that takes him back to, especially to David and, uh, and, and Abraham. He wants to present Jesus as the promised king descended from David, the Christ who would rule over God's kingdom. He wants to present Jesus as uh, the descendant of Abraham, uh, the one through whom God had promised to, to bless, bring blessing to, the, to all the nations, right? Um, so it's, it's very likely that it's Jewish God. Matthew is Jewish. He's writing especially for a, a, a Jewish audience. But, of course, just because you might have a primary audience in mind, uh, it doesn't mean uh, that you, you're not preaching more broad. He's not speaking to more broadly than that. So, for example, if you're preaching a sermon, right, uh, and your maybe your congregation is predominantly one particular age group, right? maybe you've got quite a lot of young people in your church, right? Uh, you know, there's some parents, there's also some old people there, there's some, some children, but it's mostly lots of young adults. Then, of course, when you're preaching your sermon, more, more of your examples and your things, you're going to be focusing on the young adults and it's there in front of you. But that doesn't mean that you're not speaking to the older people or to the families. And it's, it doesn't mean that you won't have anything that's relevant to them. You see, you you can be specific but also broad at the same time. And it's very likely that that's how all, what, what, what all the Gospels are like. So to say that Matthew is his primary audience is for the Jews, it doesn't mean that he doesn't care about the Gentiles. And it doesn't mean that uh, it's not a Gospel for the Gentiles too. It's just that it's of a different character to say the Gospel of Mark. And that's recognisable uh, at, even in the way that, that it, it opens, right? Um, and, and so a guy called Richard Balcom, he argues that the gospel is written for all, including, uh, including Gentiles. And I think you see that in the way that the gospel of Matthew begins and ends, right? Remember, this is meant to be the most Jewish of all the gospels, but how does Matthew begin and end his gospel? Right? Let's have a, have a, have a look. So, of course, in Matthew chapter 2, which is uh, infancy account, Matthew's infancy account, we have the wise men. Uh, and the wise men, they come from the east. That, that, that is, they're not, they, these are not Jewish people. These are Gentiles, right? And they come to the child and they bow down and worship him. So you have Matthew begins his gospel with the nations bowing in worship before King Jesus. How does Matthew end his gospel? exactly the same way isn't it we have uh the disciples the 11 disciples uh they see the resurrected jesus and they worship him and then the great commission go and make disciples of all the nations so we begin with the nations coming to jesus we end with jesus sending the disciples out to the nations you can see that matthew is concerned with the nations. Just because it's a Jewish gospel doesn't mean that he's not concerned with the nations. And of course, that makes perfect sense if you are familiar with the Old Testament, because what was the promises to Abraham? The promise to Abraham was, right, I will make you a great nation, I'll bless you, and I'll make you great so that you will be a blessing. But I will also bless those who bless you, him who dishonors you will curse, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So it's blessing for Israel first, but then overflowing blessing to the nations. That's Matthew's model, you see. Uh, or you think about uh, the, su the suffering servant, say in Isaiah 49.6, and, and Matthew uh, has quite a lot of quotations uh, about the suffering servant. 49.6, it's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Right? God's servant, yes, 
he restores Israel, but ultimately he brings salvation to, uh, to the world. And I think that's what we see uh, in, uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew. So, yes, it's a Jewish gospel. Jesus is presented as the Jewish Messiah, but the Jewish Messiah was the one who would bring salvation and blessing to the nations. And so that's ultimately what Matthew wants too, right? Uh, and so it, it, it is a gospel for everyone. It's not just a gospel for Jewish people, right? Uh, okay, uh, so if we were going to look at the things that is kind of unique then uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, here's a list of things that, that, that Carson comes up with. Uh, uh, Jesus is the promised Messiah, the son of David, the son of God, the son of man, Emmanuel. Those are some of the titles that Matthew likes to use. Uh, Jesus is rejected by many Jews, especially the Jewish leaders. The promised eschatological kingdom has dawned through the life, death, resurrection, and exaltation of Christ. So he's focused on the kingdom of heaven. Jesus reigns over the world now, and believers are to submit to his authority and witness to the world. So Jesus is presented as the king to whom we must submit. Jesus will return to bring the consummation of the kingdom which he has inaugurated. So those are some of the you know, the emphasis, uh, I guess, that, that can be detected here. Okay, let me just pause there. Uh, any questions you want to ask on those preliminary matters so far? Um, Tim, um, when you say it's the beginning of the book that calls the nations in, uh, where were you referring to as in terms of how you're bringing the whole nations together? Well, I'd say the, the book begins, uh, Matthew chapter 2, the wise men coming mm -hmm. to worship the baby Jesus, and it ends with Jesus worshipped by the disciples and sent out to make disciples of the nations. So it begins with the nations coming, the wise men, um, mm -hmm. and it ends with, uh, you know, going out to the nations. So, yeah. I see. The, okay, coming up the wise men. I, I, I didn't see that as the whole world, but I see that as <laughs> the East <laughs> side. Yeah, but okay. the point the point is that they're Gentiles. Yeah, they're not okay. Jews. He's worshipped by non-Jews. That's the point. Non-Jews. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, let's come now then to the structure of Matthew. And uh, here is where I think Matthew is very much, a, uh, it's, it's a great book. And I, uh, I, it really excites me to kind of delve and to discover more of how he's written it here. Um, of course, it's always important whenever you're reading any piece of writing, especially in the Bible, that you understand how the book works, right? How is it put together? How does it flow, right? And there's no doubt, all scholars agree, that Matthew was a literary craftsman, right? He has a very complex structure uh, to his gospel. Uh, in many ways, it's an overlapping structure. He's got structures on top of structures and things like that. And uh, understanding those structures, I think, helps us uh, to know how to read it. So we're going to look at this in a, in a couple of different layers here and then try and bring it all together, right? So, uh, so the first thing is, uh, he basically follows Mark, right, um, in having the geographical structure. So remember in Mark's gospel, Jesus begins in Galilee uh, and then he goes on a journey to Jerusalem following the turning point at Caesarea Philippi where Peter says, you are the Christ. So he's in Galilee, turning point at Caesarea Philippi. He journeys to Jerusalem he, he does his ministry in Jerusalem and then he dies on the cross and he's resurrected. Right? And Matthew essentially preserves that. Uh, Luke does too, of course, right? Uh, so you've got a, a kind of a prologue, just as, you know, Mark, Mark's prologue is quite short, right? Maybe verses 1 to 15. Uh, Matthew's got his prologue, including the birth narrative and John the Baptist, first four chapters, then public ministry in the north. Uh, as he, he heals and teaches and so on. Uh, then 
uh, you've got uh, the incident at Caesarea Philippi, which in Matthew's gospel is in chapter 16, right? So it's got quite a lot of extra material before that. Uh, and then after that, it's, it, it follows Mark quite closely. Uh, and then finally, ministry in Jerusalem, chapters 21 to 25, matching Mark 11 to 13. Uh, and then the passion narrative, which we've already seen, Matthew's passion narrative is almost identical to uh, to, to Mark's one. So, uh, so yeah, it, it has the same kind of geographical structure, but then again, so does Luke. So that doesn't tell you anything particular about Matthew's unique uh, focus. Now, in the case of Matthew, uh, there's a little phrase that kind of divides it up into uh, into three sections, right? And that that's the fr that's the phrase from this point on Jesus began to do something right so we find that in Matthew 4 verse uh, 17 Matthew 4 17 from that time Jesus began to preach saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and suggests that you know something there's a change or there's something new uh, that's coming there uh, see, it's the same phrase, exactly the same words in Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem. Um, and it's a similar, this one's a similar turning point to what we saw in Mark, because just before this, this is where uh, Peter has said, you are the Christ, and then we have the first passion prediction. Um, so it, it, it makes sense uh, that those words is indicating that we're heading into into a new section. So in that sense, we uh, those words perhaps suggest that we can break it into three main parts, chapters 1 to 4, uh, and then chapters 4 to 16, uh, and then chapters uh, you know, 16, 16 to 28 to, uh, to the end. Uh, and, and some scholars have suggested um, this kind of a, uh, this kind of a structure, right? Uh, so yeah. Uh, now, some people have argued that um, that this geographical structure, then it kind of also aligns to a dramatic structure. That is, it's kind of like an unfolding story. You know, in a story, you have a setting, then you have a conflict or a crisis, rising tension, a client, which leads up to a climax, and there's a resolution and a kind of epilogue. Right. So some people have kind of argued that maybe Matthew follows that kind of uh, structure as well. And then as they try to summarize the plot of it, they put it in those three parts, right? So the, the person of Jesus, uh, the proclamation of Jesus, the passion and resurrection of Jesus. Now, as you can see there, that's probably a bit too neat. And lots of people have kind of, uh, uh, you know, pushed back on that uh, in, 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 in various ways. Uh, the fact that we know the ending of the story uh, before we get to it kind of spoils it to some extent. Uh, but, yeah, um, perhaps it's also getting at something too, isn't it? That the Gospels are the greatest story of all time. And uh, certainly we've seen how great a storyteller Mark was. Uh, and there's probably no doubt that Matthew was, was equally good in telling his his story too. Now, remember to tell it a story doesn't say it's a story doesn't mean that it's not true. We're talking about real events, real history, but it's written as narrative. It's written as a written as a story, a true story. Right. right so we've got this kind of ge geographical structure. Uh, we've got this kind of dramatic structure with three main movements in it. Uh, but I think probably the most interesting one that people have observed is uh, is the literary. The literary structure and this seems to be especially where Matthew has has, has left his mark uh, and that is Matthew seems to have superimposed his own structure over the top of uh, what is already there with Mark so he's got Mark and he retains Mark in its basic shape but then he he layers on top of that uh, his his own structure right uh, and this this own structure is indicated by a repeated phrase, and that's the repeated phrase. When Jesus had finished saying these things, uh, it you find that phrase five times. It always happens at the end of uh, a major teaching block or discourse, and, it, and it's not found anywhere else. 
Uh, and so that really suggests that it's really a structural marker. So Matthew 7, 28, uh, this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, when Jesus had finished say these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Matthew 11, 1. When he finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Matthew 13, 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. Matthew 19, 1. When Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Matthew 26, 1. When Jesus had finished these, say these sayings, he said to his uh, disciples. And what you find then is that Matthew has these five long discourses, right? A discourse is a speech, right? And we saw in Mark's gospel, Mark doesn't really have these, these long discourses. He's got the parables in Mark 4. He's got the apocalyptic discourse in Mark 13, two extended blocks of teaching. Uh, but Matthew has five, and his is his are much longer um, than Mark. So, of course, most famously, we have the Sermon on the Mount, right, uh, which goes from Matthew 5 to, uh, to 7, uh, and we'll look at that later. Then we have another uh, long teaching in Matthew 10. By the way, if you do, if you have a red letter Bible, you can see there, right? There's lots of red, right? Before that, you've got lots of white, right? All the narrative. You know, Jesus does say some things, but it's mainly narrative, right? Then you've got a speech as you come to chapter five. Lots of red as Jesus is speaking. End of that, back to narrative again, right? Lots of narrative. And then we hit chapter 10. And we have another uh, another discourse, right? This is Jesus sending out the apostles, warning them about persecution, uh, who they should fear. So it's a, it's a long section of uh, read about gospel witness and persecution. Right? Uh, and then we come to the next one. Uh, we have we're back to white, right? Uh, uh, and you know all these little narrative episodes until we hit chapter 13, right? And once we hit chapter 13, right, then we've got the uh, the parables uh, and, you know, one uh, most of a chapter there, um, him, ex him explaining the parables, right? Then we're back to white again, lots of, lots of narrative. Most of this content is uh, repeated from Mark, right? Uh, until we hit chapter 18. Uh, chapter 18, we have another discourse. This time it's, it's mainly focused on the church. Back to the white again. Uh, and, and then the final, the final speech is in chapter, uh, chapter 23 to 25, right? Another long section of, of, of discourse. So in other words, Matthew likes to alternate between discourse, speech, and narrative. And he goes between it. How many sections of discourse are there? There's five, right? Probably five narratives to go with it. And then many would argue that there's a the prologue at the beginning and then there's a climax at the end, right? A six narrative section, the passion narrative at the end, right? Five speeches, five, uh, five narrative sections. Now, what, why would Matthew? want to have five speeches and five narrative sections. I mean, if you're thinking in a Jewish way, why would you want to do that? What do you have five of in the Old Testament? Anyone? I thought you were doing it at 10, five and five. <laughs> no, it's a repetition of two fives, yeah. Yeah. Right. Five, you've got Pentateuch. Pentateuch, the law, right? The law had five books: Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Yeah. Uh, and so is it the case, and, and, and this is certainly what has been uh, been been argued by various people, uh, that uh, Matthew is presenting the gospel as kind of like the new the new law. We might call it the new covenant or the new testament um uh, and jesus therefore is the the greater the greater moses the, the prophet like moses the greater um, the greater moses and 
there's probably something to that, isn't it? Uh, I mean, let me just let me just put it up on the screen again. All right, so you can see the this this alternation here. Uh, yeah. He must have some purpose, right, for doing it in this way. Now, the, the guy who, who observed this structure, the first is a guy called Bacon. He's probably quite easy to remember if you like eating bacon, I guess. Uh, he, he, he was the one who observed this. And that's what, he, that, that's what he argued. He argued that this was Matthew's self-conscious response to and fulfillment of the five books of Moses. Now, it's a mistake to think, okay, let's look at the first speech and see how that relates to Genesis and the second speech, how does that relate to Exodus? That's that's not the point here. That that just doesn't work, right? Um, it's more the point of, okay, you've got five books of the Old Testament and then five books of, it, 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 five sections, if you like, in the gospel, a bit like in the Psalms. I mean, as you read the Psalms, remember the Psalms is divided up into five books as well. Surely that is, is echoing um, the, the five-fold structure of, of, of the Pentateuch. And there's lots of parallels between Moses and Jesus. And so it, it's reasonable to conclude uh, that it's, it's deliberate. Right? Now, there might be a, a, uh, further reasons why, uh, why Matthew has done this as well. Um, remember how Matthew ends his gospel, go and make disciples of all nations. Matthew wants us to make disciples. And so perhaps here he's giving us material uh, that can be used for discipleship, this long chunks of Jesus' teaching. Remember what, it, what does it mean to be a disciple uh, in Matthew 28? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And so he gives us these long lists, uh, you know, these long sections of Jesus' teaching, Jesus' commands for us that we are to imitate and to, you know, obey uh, as, as disciples. So perhaps that's part of uh, Matthew's purpose here too, to give us material for, for discipleship to, um, to happen. And again, that seems to be a very reasonable conclusion uh, to explain uh, the way that he has um, Put, yeah, he's, he's, he's structured his gospel. Um, yeah, so if you want to put those two things together, then uh, the extended discourses are one way of, on the one hand, showing the authority of Jesus, and on the other hand, calling for a response um, to what Jesus has, has said, a, a response of obedience. Yeah. Uh, and I think you see that uh, as you look at the five, uh, the, the five teaching sections, they often end with you needing to make uh, some kind of uh, choice or, or, or response. Let me pull up the notes again. Right, so say the first, uh, this is Bacon's proposal, right? The first section is focused on discipleship, the second section is focused on apostleship, third one is on, on revelation, this is the parables, the fourth one on church, the fifth one on, on the final judgment. Uh, if you look at the end of each of those, there's a kind of a call to response. So the end of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, you've got the wise and the, uh, and the foolish uh, builder, and you've got the narrow path and the wide path and so on, right? Um, Build your house on the rock. Don't build your house on the sand. It's a it's a call to make a response, right? Uh, chapter ten again. It's a similar thing. You've got a divided, you've got a divided response, right? Are you going to side with Jesus or are you going to uh, are you going to side with your with, with your family? Uh, Matthew thirteen. We already seen in Mark that the purpose of the parables is to divide the hearers. There's four soils, four different. Uh, different responses. Uh, and then Matthew 18, uh, it's kind of dividing who's in the church and who's out of the church. Remember, Matthew 18 has the, uh, yeah, has the section about uh, church discipline in there. Uh, and then Matthew 23 to 25, kind of the final, the final judgment. And, and of course, it's got those famous uh, 
parables of Jesus, like uh, separating the sheep on the the sheep and the goats, right? The sheep on the right, the goats, uh, the goats on the left. There's. It seems like each of the the teaching sections they end up with two paths, two choices, and 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 you're being called to make a response, Jesus side or uh, or, or or not, right? So yeah, I think that's I think it's really interesting how um, how Matthew has uh, has structured his gospel. On the one hand, preserving Mark faithfully, and on the other hand, layering on his own structure for his own purposes um, to bring out his own theology. And so it makes it uh, quite complex uh, as these these various structures overlap with each other. So if we put those uh, put it all together, then. Uh, then, and this is how Carson does it, you've got prologue, gospel of the kingdom, kingdom extended under Jesus' authority, teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, rising opposition, opposition and eschatology, passion and resurrection. He's, Carson's brought into those seven sections. Now, what also makes it interesting is not only does Matthew have these kind of macro structures, but then he's got his micro structures too, right? So at the moment, we've just been observing, okay, he goes from discourse, narrative, discourse, narrative, discourse, narrative. He's got a geographical structure, whatever, right? That's, that's macro, right? We're looking over chapters. That. But Matthew also seems to be quite careful about how he structures it in the small sections too, right? So, for example, he likes to have sets of three or so. We call them triads, right? So, uh, so, so Carson says, like when he's doing the uh, telling the parables, he'll have three parables about the growing seed. He loves to have a set of three. He also loves chiasms too, and as we'll see in a moment, there's a number of chiasms. Many people would argue that the parables in chapter thirteen are structured as a chiasm, and a chiasm is where you have, you know, uh, a, and you've got something different. B, maybe then you've got a C in the middle, then you come back to B, come back to A. So you've got the things on the edges match each other and the things in the middle match each other. It's kind of like a, you know, it's like a, an X or like a cross, chiasm. <laughs> so Matthew seems to like this. And, of course, they're very Jewish ways of, 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 of writing. Um, you tend to find uh, chiasms in various places in, in, in the Bible. You, can't, you, you seem to find these repetitions in various places in the Bible too. It's a very Jewish way of writing. And Matthew loves these things uh, on a small level, even as he has his big structure too. Uh, so we might ask, okay, well, what's the contribution of Matthew? And there's so many things we could say here, but here's, a, I guess, a couple of points that we could, uh, we could single out here, right? One of the great things about Matthew's gospel is that it preserves large sections of Jesus' teaching that are arranged by topic. That's a great thing about Matthew. Uh, of course, uh, another thing about Matthew is it has its, the birth narrative. Remember, Mark doesn't have a birth narrative, and it's, it's told from Joseph's perspective. Luke has a birth narrative to, told through Mary's perspective, right? But Matthew's is through Joseph's perspective. Uh, another great thing about Matthew is he richly uses the Old Testament. There are so many Old Testament quotations in Matthew. And so it really helps us to see how to understand the Old Testament in the light of Christ. Um, uh, Matthew has a very rich treatment of the law, right, and how Jesus fulfills the law. I think we'll see that in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Matthew has a lot of teaching about church as well. Uh, again, most famously, the stuff about church discipline in chapter 18. But, um, you know, Matthew uses the word church, ecclesia, in his, in his gospel in a way the other gospels don't. Right? Uh, and, and, of course, Matthew has his own unique ways of talking about Jesus too, right? So, for example, he is Emmanuel, God with us in chapter 1. That's something that's unique uh, in, in, in the gospel of Matthew, right? So we'll discuss some of those things um, below in a bit more detail, but there's some of the uh, great things uh, about the gospel of Matthew. So what are some of the main themes that we have here, right? So, uh, or, or characteristics. So we've talked about the uh, the Jewishness of it already, 
right? Um, so untranslated Aramaic terms, uh, Jewish rituals that are mentioned but not explained. So uh, if you remember when we were in, in Mark's gospel, when we got to chapter 7, Mark 7, uh, and the Pharisees were upset that the disciples ate without washing their hands. And then Mark gave this long explanation. The Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders, etc. He, he explains through tradition. He doesn't, ex, he doesn't assume that uh, his readers understand what are all these Jewish traditions. But when you look at the parallel passage in, in Matthew, he doesn't bother to do that, right? Um, he, he, just, he just continues straight on, right? So that... That shows you that he just assumes that you're, you're, you're familiar with these things. There's all kinds of Jewish things that he mentions, like in chapter 23, verse 5, he talks about how the scribes, they love to make their phylacteries broad, their fringes uh, long, right? These were the pieces of scripture that were tied on the body with tassels, right? Uh, I mean, he, doesn't, he doesn't explain it. He, just, he, he, he assumes that the reader knows what it is. He opens with a genealogy, the fact that he does that, placing it at the beginning, it's very Jewish, right? Uh, and when he cites from the Old Testament, he doesn't always cite from the Greek Old Testament. Okay? Um, that's different to, say, the Gospel of Luke, right? The Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, Luke pretty much always uh, makes his Old Testament citations from the Greek Old Testament. But Matthew doesn't. Matthew sometimes does, but usually he doesn't. Right? Um, he's, he's normally quoting from the Hebrew Old, Old Testament. Uh, he uses the title Son of David much more than the other Gospels. I mean, it happened once in Mark with uh, blind Bartimaeus saying, uh, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. But Matthew has it nine times, right? Uh, again, and it, it, it's, a, it's a very Jewish title to use. And, and Matthew, uh, he doesn't use the term kingdom of God. This is also another feature of Matthew's gospel. He always talks about the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God. Because remember the Jews, they didn't like to say God's name, right? So they used to uh, try and talk about God in more roundabout ways. So this is a very Jewish way of talking. I mean, it essentially means the same thing. You can talk about the kingdom of heaven. Who rules heaven? God God rules heaven, right? So kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God. But Matthew chooses to call it the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't call it the kingdom of the kingdom of God. So uh, th those, those are some of the very Jewish kind of aspects of, of, of this gospel. Uh, we've already talked about the Gentile, the Gentile mission um, and and how that's complementary, ending with the Great Commission. Uh, Matthew has a strong focus on Jesus fulfilling scripture, right? There are so many uh, examples of this formula. So I think you can see it here. Matthew one twenty two. all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Matthew 2.15, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Matthew 2.17, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Matthew 2.23, he went and lived in the city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. Matthew 3.15, uh, let it now be so, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Matthew 4.14, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Now, all of those happen in the first four chapters, right? There's going to be a lot more in the following chapters too. But again and again and again, saying, look, Fulfilling the scriptures, fulfilling the scriptures, fulfilling the scriptures, fulfilling the scriptures. It's a, it's a big thing that he uh, that he says. In fact, when you get to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he, uh, Jesus says, don't think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Right? So. Uh, yeah, that we have this this emphasis on Jesus fulfilling all of the scriptures, and, and of course, as we get to the, towards the end of the gospel, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. 
Uh, so Jesus is going to fulfill everything um, in his, his ministry. Uh, and that's why in the end, he says, all authority has been given to me and we must obey Jesus' commands. Right? So in that sense, Matthew is really helpful in thinking, in teaching us how to read the Old Testament in the light of, uh, of Christ. Right? Uh, whether it's fulfilling various predictions, like Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, he'd be a descendant from David, or various uh, you know, typologies. You know, uh, you know, Jesus goes down to Egypt and then he comes out of Egypt back into the promised land, just like Israel is slaves of Egypt and they return to the promised land. So he has these Old Testament patterns that are being you know, recapitulated or rewalked in, in, in Jesus' life um, and, and, and so on, right? So Matthew has a lot about Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament direct prophecies, patterns, uh, and uh, typologies, and, and, and so on. Uh, then uh, there's the teaching aspect of it, and uh, we've noted this already, but of course that's what uh, Matthew's name means, right? Uh, Matthew's name sounds like disciple, right? Matthew, the word for disciple in Greek is mathetes. Right? It's very close to Matthew's name. Right? Matthew's name means disciple. Right? Uh, one of the most famous verses in Matthew's gospel is in chapter 11 and verse 29. Uh, just before that, 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, and learn from me, right? Or, or literally be discipled, uh, be, be taught by me, be, be discipled by me. For I'm gentle and lowly of heart. You will find rest uh, for, your, uh, for your soul. And, and so it's no surprise then if that Matthew focuses so, focuses so much on Jesus' teaching. And not just in Mark, Mark tells you that Jesus was teaching, and he doesn't usually give you the contents of it. But Matthew, with his long discourses, uh, he wants us to hear, hear the teaching of Jesus and be, um, yeah, and, and therefore be discipled by it. Right? So teaching, uh, then, uh, then there's the church, and uh, it's not just a concept, but it's a name. So uh, at the turning point, of course, uh, Jesus says to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Uh, and, and then the church discipline in Matthew 18. And there's lots of connections between Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church in Matthew's gospel. So, for example, uh, 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, Passover and the Lord's Supper, Old Covenant, the New Covenant. Um, you know, the, the law says, be holy. Leviticus 19 to Jesus says, be perfect uh, in, in the Sermon on the Mount. So there's lots of uh, connections there uh, between, uh, between the two. Right? So yeah, those are some of the, I guess, the main characteristics or features um, of Matthew that you can see make it quite different, actually, um, from the Gospel of Mark. Right? Let me pause there. Any questions you want to ask about that? Uh, Tim, when you say that uh, there's a strong focus on the Gentile mission, where will you see that? Well, uh, the things we've already seen, seen with the, the wise men coming, ending with the Great Commission, but of course a lot of the stuff that you have in Mark's Gospel, uh, mm -hmm. say in chapters, Mark chapters 6 to 8, you had dealing with the Syrophoenician woman and all um, Feeding of the four thousand in the Gentile territory, all that, all that material you will also find in, in in Matthew too. And there's other examples we could give. Yeah, but I would read it as that that will be exactly true to what Jesus have done, uh, rather than actually seeing it as uh, Matthew saying it, or in another word, Matthew is just following what Mark says. Um, so would that be a focus in terms of Gentile? Well, uh, I mean, uh, certainly Matthew, I mean, certainly we've seen with Mark, Mark's concerned about proclamation and 
you know, he, he wants the gospel to be proclaimed in all the world and that comes out in Mark 13, etc. Uh, but Mark doesn't have a have a great commission. I mean, the ending of Mark is meant to push you out into yes. the nations to preach the gospel. That's why it ends in that cliffhanger ending. But, um, but Mark doesn't have a great commission at the end. But Matthew specifically has that. So it, it shows you that that is something that is a particular focus because he's chosen to put that in when Mark doesn't have it. Okay. Yeah. Right. There are specific things that Matthew would add on, although very Jewish, but it still includes whatever that Mark's in, and that's he could actually, okay, not follow it, but he did, as well as in the end, it was also a great commission to call the Jewish people to go and make disciples of every nation. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, well, uh, if you can stay with me for the another half an hour, I'm going to do a quick run through of all 28 chapters in 28 minutes. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and then we'll take our break and, and we'll spend the remaining hour to think specifically about the Sermon on the Mount. Right? So, uh, yeah, so buckle yourself in and, and let's have a, a turbo run through. Uh, the gospel of, of Matthew, right? So remember we start Matthew's gospel uh, with something of a prologue uh, and it begins, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's an unmistakable reference to Genesis and Matthew intends this right from the start to see his gospel as the culmination and fulfillment of the Old Testament. That's why David and Abraham are, are so significant here because they are the the two big covenants that God makes, covenant with Abraham to bless the nations, the covenant with David that his son would rule the nations uh, forever. And so he's indicating, look, if you want to understand my gospel, the good news about Jesus, you've got to understand it as the fulfillment of those Old Testament uh, uh, covenants. But it's not just that, but also in the light of the exile and the return as well. So you see this opening chapter, it's divided into these uh, 14 generations, all the generations from Abraham to David were 14, from David to the deportation were 14, from the deportation to Christ, 14 generations. So he's, he's kind of dividing up history into these three epochs or, uh, or, or, or sections, right? Now, if you go back and you see where did he construct the genealogy from, he's left out some names or whatever to make it exactly 14 generations, right? Two times 14 is two times seven, seven is the number of perfection, etc. So you can see how he's, he's, he's laying out a way of understanding uh, Old Testament history. You start with the promise to Abraham, then you have David the king, and then you have the exile, the loss of the promise, right? And it's in the light of those three things that we are to understand the coming of. Uh, of, of Jesus. There's other things we could say here. Uh, the genealogy has a has a chiastic structure to it, right? that circular structure. There's lots of unexpected names here. Um, uh, Judah is mentioned because his tribe is the Messianic tribe, that you've got four women who are mentioned in here. Uh, you've got Tamar in verse three, you've got Rahab, uh, you've got Ruth, uh, you've got Bathsheba. In fact, Bathsheba's name is not mentioned, but Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Uh, and it's very unusual to mention women in genealogies. Uh, and, of course, many of them are Gentile women. Rahab was a prostitute. Tamar dressed like a prostitute to make, uh, to make Judah uh, pregnant, if you remember. Bathsheba committed adultery with David, etc. cetera. Uh, so here is God. Uh, you know, here's the nations present. Uh, in Jesus' genealogy, but also uh, these people who were uh, involved in various sins and God and his sovereignty working in and, uh, in and through that, right? Uh, and, and then you have a, a, a kind of second genesis, right? Uh, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, and it's the same word, the birth here, the, the word is genesis, right? So if we have, uh, you know, this is, this is the... Genesis or the beginning of, 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 of Jesus. 
and and of course his Jesus doesn't come from uh, in in the normal way. Uh, they're not yet married yet. Uh, Jesus is born of of a virgin, and we're told that this is to fulfil uh, the prophecy from Isaiah: "The virgin shall conceive and bear a son; they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God, uh, God with us." Right. Uh, then we, uh, we we continue on, and uh, we see, I guess, Jesus geographical origins right so he's he's born in bethlehem uh which is significant because uh that's where king david was born um and then he has to flee to egypt to escape from from herod who's killing all the children and what does that remind you of you know in the exodus there is king pharaoh the pharaoh is killing all the children all the babies here here you have this uh, repeat it again. You have an evil king killing all the babies. And where does Jesus flee to? He flees to Egypt, right? Uh, and we're told that this is to fulfill a prophecy. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, that quotation is from Hosea. Uh, it's originally about the nation of Israel, whom God called out of um, Egypt to be his son. Now, here you see Jesus repeating those steps. He comes out of Egypt and he goes to Nazareth. Uh, and again, so that the scriptures might be fulfilled, that he would be called uh, a, a, a Nazarene. What's what's the significance about, uh, about that? Is it something related to Isaiah 53, servant? Um, yeah, uh, or his kingship in some way? That's a good question to ask, right? Right, then uh, we, we come to the uh, how Mark begins with, uh, with, with John the Baptist. and uh, you have uh, John preparing the way for Jesus and the idea of a, um, the, the new exodus that, that, that is being brought as God breaks into history to save uh, to save and walk his people. You have the baptism of Jesus uh, where the spirit comes on him, the voice comes on him, uh, uh, declares, this is my beloved son with you, I'm well pleased, identifying who Jesus is, the promised Christ uh, and, and the promised, uh, the promised servant. Uh, and then the temptation of Jesus. Uh, here is Jesus, the, the faithful and obedient son, you know, you know, not like Israel, tempted in the wilderness who failed, certainly not like Adam uh, and Eve, tempted by the devil and sinned. Jesus, who, who is faithful. And then the beginning of uh, Jesus' public, public ministry, and again with a quotation from Isaiah, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. For those dwelling in the region, shadow of death, on them has light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So he asked, well, where is the, you know, the focus on the nations? Here's another example, isn't it? Where does Jesus begin? He begins his ministry in Galilee of the Gentiles. Uh, as a sign that uh, he's the light who, ha who has come into the world. Right? So there's our first uh, first four chapters. Uh, and then we have him uh, calling calling the disciples, ministering to the crowds. Uh, and remember in Mark's gospel, the, the crowds are amazed because Jesus teaches with authority, but that's not what, uh, what Matthew does here. He shows us Jesus' authoritative teaching at length with this, uh, with this Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and then he ends by saying they were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. In other words, all that material showing Jesus' authority, that's just like, uh, you know, that, that small section that, that Mark gives it in chapter, uh, chapter one of, of, of Mark. Uh, at that point, uh, we come back to the narrative section. We'll, we'll say more about the Sermon on the Mount in a moment, but uh, uh, in chapters uh, chapter 8, then we come back to the narrative uh, section again. And lots of the material here, it follows Mark, doesn't it, right? So cleansing of the leper, um, faith of centurion, Jesus healing lots of people, um, Jesus calming the storm, Jesus driving out the demons into the pigs, 
healing of the paralyzed man, calling of Levi, Matthew here, the tax collector. Um, you know, the questions about, uh, about fasting um, and, and, and so on, right? So there's a lot, of, a lot of material in this section that is really repeating stuff uh, from, uh, from Mark, right? Uh, and it's interesting, this section is kind of bookended with, this very, with a very similar uh, phrase. So you can see here in chapter 4, verse 35, he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Chapter 4. And then in chapter 9, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. And that's a good summary, I guess, of what you see uh, in between. Right? So we have his power to restore outcasts, call for radical discipleship, his power over, the, over death, to calm the storm, he can, uh, he can face off with evil. Um, uh, and he can even defeat the power of, of death. Now, it's interesting. Some uh, people note here that, again, Matthew likes to group things in threes, and it's possible here we've got three cycles of three, uh, three miracles. Uh, so, you know, why, why would we do this? Why would we have three times three um, and then an extra one to make it ten? Well... Is it talking something, you know, is it, is, it, is it a kind of symbolic way of talking about how comprehensive um, Jesus' power is? Uh, is it, you know, just as there's 10 plagues in Egypt, you have you, you hear these uh, 10, 10 miracles that correspond to it. People notice these kinds of patterns or, um, or, or, or connections. Uh, uh, with the with the Old Testament, uh, and uh, another another way of seeing it that it's not just a random collection of miracle stories here, um, but there's a there's a pattern here of you have a healing, you have a description of ministry, and then of Jesus' ministry, and then you have an exhortation to discipleship, healing, ministry, discipleship, healing ministry, uh, discipleship. Let me see if I can illustrate that. So uh, the healing, say chapter 8, verses 1 to 15, healing the leper um, and so on. Then uh, something about Jesus, uh, uh, an interpretation of this ministry from Isaiah's prophecy, so verse 16. That evening they brought to him all who were oppressed by demons. He cast out the spirits with the word. He healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. That's Isaiah 53 and verse 4. Right? Then a teaching about uh, discipleship. Right? Uh, you, yeah, you need to, to, to follow Jesus. Then more miracles here, uh, 23 down to 9, verse 8. Then uh, uh, Jesus explaining why he eats with uh, sinners. Uh, and then a section about uh, uh, discipleship, right? uh, calling, calling uh, Matthew to follow him. So perhaps you have this kind of uh, threefold structure here. Right? Eventually, this is going to bring you to chapter 10. Uh, and this is going to be our next uh, uh, teaching uh, teaching section. Right? Uh, so chapter 10, uh, it's about witness and being ready for persecution and and, and so on. So he sends out the uh, he sends out the apostles, he warns he warns them about uh, persecution. he he assures them that the Holy Spirit's going to, speak through them when they're when they're in that time you know a disciple is not above his teacher a servant above his master it's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher the servant like his master if they call the master of the house feels well how much more will they malign those of his household but don't fear them fear him who can 
uh, yeah, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul uh, in hell. So it's a long, uh, yeah, long, long teaching here, mainly about uh, witness of the gospel, being ready to face persecution, fearing God, not fearing, uh, fearing people. Then we come into the back into the narrative section, and uh, a lot of this stuff again is repeated from from Mark. We saw in uh, in Mark, there's a section about uh, rejection, right? And so you have uh, uh, and, 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 and growing kind of opposition, uh, hostility to Jesus. So it, it begins here with, uh, with, with John the Baptist, his disciples asking, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? And he points to all his miracles saying, yeah, go and tell John what you've seen. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. Bless is the one who's not offended by me. I really am the Messiah, can't you see, from my teaching, from my miracles. I'm fulfilling the Old Testament. Yes, I am the one who is to come. But what happened to John the Baptist and what happened to him? What's going to happen to him? Right? So the prophets... The, the prophets uh, had a violent end. Uh, they rejected John the Baptist too, and now they're going to reject G Jesus as well. So he calls down these woes on the cities um, that have uh, not responded in faith uh, to, to, to all, of, all of his miracles. Um, right? You've got uh, some of these episodes repeated from, from Mark. Uh, conflict over the Sabbath, conflict of the men with the with, with the withered hand. Um, you know, the, uh, them saying that Jesus is possessed by Beelzebul and his family saying that he's crazy and so on. This all, all this stuff of rejection, uh, rejection of of, of Jesus, uh, and and just like in in Mark uh, chapters one, uh, two, and three, all that growing rejection of Jesus leads us into the parables in, in Mark chapter four. Same thing in, in, in Matthew. So we have the parables come in Matthew chapter uh, chapter 13, explaining uh, all these different responses with the parable of the soils and, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, and in the same way as Mark, we've got the explanation. Why is Jesus speaking in parables? Right? Um, it's to fulfill uh, this prophecy from Isaiah to divide his hearers into those who will come and listen and those who uh, who, who, who don't come to him in faith. Okay? Um, you've got these parables about the growing the growing kingdom. And again, the point we saw in Mark is that uh, even though there are various responses to Jesus and only one soil is the good soil, in the end, even though the kingdom seems unremarkable and small, it's going to grow into a great a great kingdom in the end. And so Matthew 13, very similar to Mark chapter uh, chapter four. Uh, and as I said before, it's probably structured in a in a chiasm. You can look, you can test that out later if you want. Right, then we come to chapter 14. We're back into the uh, to the narrative section again. Right, and uh, and and rejection, right? So Jesus rejected it his hometown, the death of John the Baptist. Uh, and and as in Mark, um, Jesus being compared as the true shepherd of his people, who has compassion on the crowd, as opposed to Herod, who is this evil king who's using people for his own uh, for his own uh, benefit. A lot again, a lot of the material here repeated. Jesus walking walking on the water. Uh, Jesus calling the the Pharisees uh, hypocrites and saying what defiles the person is not what is the outside, but what's in the heart. And uh, you've got Jesus healing uh, these various uh, Gentile uh, people like the Syrophoenician uh, woman um, and, uh, and Jesus feeding, uh, feeding the 4,000. And, and remember the first part of, of, of Mark's gospel, it comes to the climax as the Pharisees demand for a sign and Jesus said, I'm not giving you one. Um, and then Jesus warns the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they are discussing that they have no bread. And then Jesus asks all those searching questions, right? 
Uh, do you not yet perceive? Don't you remember about the loaves? Right? How is it that you fail to understand? I'm not talking about bread. Right? And all this leads up to Peter confessing that Jesus is the Christ. You see how uh, what, what Matthew's done here is he's really, he's preserved the material in, in, in Mark and how Mark uses that material, but then he adds in his own his own parts, especially the teaching sections uh, uh, around that. I think what he does with the uh, with the turning point now, uh, with Peter confessing Jesus as the Christ, is interesting because remember how Mark does it. Just before Peter says, you are the Christ, we had that two-stage healing of the blind man. First time he sees but not clearly, and then the second time he sees clearly. And, and we saw that it's kind of... It, it, it's a metaphorical teaching that's happening there. The, the, the disciples are blind. They're hard-hearted. They're ignorant. They can't see who Jesus is. And, and when Peter does see, you are the Christ. He doesn't see clearly. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Right? We saw their eyes as being progressively open to see who Jesus is. And it's, it's a work that Jesus has to do in them. Mark, and Matthew doesn't do it that way. Matthew doesn't record the two-stage healing. He removes it, right? And he puts in something else instead, some extra teaching by Jesus that essentially says exactly the same thing, right? So when Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, notice Jesus' response here. Blessed are you, Simon bar John. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Yeah. So Mark makes it kind of implicit with the two-stage healing thing. Matthew makes it explicit, right, uh, with, with the teaching of Jesus. Now, all this leads into uh, the, uh, the passion predictions now. As Jesus withdraws from the crowd to teach his disciples about you know, what it means to be disciples. Very similar. Um, right? You are the Christ. What's Jesus' mission? He's come to suffer and die and then be raised. What's the right response? Deny yourself, take up your cross uh, and follow Jesus. Followed by the transfiguration, followed by the healing of the boy with the demon, followed by the, 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 the second passion prediction, uh, the stuff about who is the greatest and so on. All this is repeated from Mark. It's, it, it's, it's the same thing and in, in, and in the same uh, order. Uh, but then Matthew adds in his, his own extra material there as well. So we come to the next discourse, which is in chapter uh, chapter 18. We notice this is the discourse about the, the church. So uh, he includes the parable of the lost sheep, the man who leaves the 99 to go and search for the one, um, the one sheep. Uh, and and, and what, what do you do if your brother sins against you? Go and tell him his fault just between you and him alone. If he doesn't listen, bring two more people to, um, to, to establish it by, by witnesses. And if he still refuses, then you tell, uh, then you tell the, whole, the whole church. Right? Um, but ultimately, he wants us to be people who forgive. So he tells the parable about the, um, the unfairness. Uh, the unforgiving servant. Um, they ask Jesus, "How how much? How many times? How often uh, will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him as many as seven times?" They're thinking that's quite a lot. Jesus says to him, "I didn't tell you seven times, but seventy seven times." And he tells that great parable about the man who's forgiven a great debt, but then he won't forgive someone who's got a smaller debt. And of course, it's teaching us. If we've been forgiven so much by Jesus, how can we not um, forgive others? No. We must forgive them again and again and again. Yeah. But this is all unique material in Matthew. It's, 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 a, it's a block of Jesus' teaching about, uh, about the church, right? Seek out the lost, right? Call the sinner to account, offer forgiveness again and again. Yeah. All right, at that point, we, uh, we resume uh, following Mark again as we go back to the narrative, teaching about divorce. Here this matches up with Mark 10, the little children coming to Jesus, then the rich young man, 
um, and, and the disciples um, saying who, who can be saved and so on. Again, that all follows uh, all follows Mark, right? Uh, all about how do you enter the kingdom, right? You don't earn your way in there. It's not about obeying the law. It's about coming like a child, helpless and dependent in faith, um, like the disciples did when they decided to follow uh, follow Jesus. And, and all this then uh, uh, leads us up to the third passion prediction. Uh, the uh, you know the disciples still wanting to be the greatest. So still Mark. Uh, the healing of the blind man, this blind Bartimaeus, uh, and and then and then Jesus comes to Jerusalem. Now we're at uh, Mark chapter uh, eleven, right? The triumphant entry, uh, cleansing of the temple, cursing of the fig tree, questioning of Jesus' authority. Parable of the tenants is also in the end of Mark eleven, uh, but uh, we also have uh, some additional material as well yes some parables uh jesus has his showdown with the with, with the religious leaders in the temple this is now mark chapter 12 right about paying taxes to caesar about uh you know who who does this man marry when well, he married seven people and they all died whose wife is there going to be in the end right what's the great commandment all this is repeated from mark uh but then we have the new uh the new material another another long discourse and uh here it, it's an extended discourse about the final judgment and uh it begins with these woes against the religious leaders who he calls hypocrites again and again i think this is it seven times here woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites verse 13 woe to you blind guides Verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Why, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, again and again, drawing out the hypocrisy of all the things that they that they do, but then they don't do it themselves. They teach, but they don't do it themselves. And it leads us up to the apocalyptic discourse. So this is in Mark 13. Uh, so remember in uh, Mark 11 to 13, we've got, Jesus pronouncing judgment on Israel because when he comes as the Messiah, they don't welcome him. There's no fruit of it. Um, and that's why he curses the fig tree. That's why he cleanses out the temple um, and, and so on. And, and then it all climaxes in Mark with chapter 13. The temple is going to be destroyed, right? And the Son of Man is going to come uh, in, in power and glory, and you've got to be ready for him. Well, that apocalyptic discourse, that is, that's Matthew 24. Uh, and as we saw when we looked at this in Mark, uh, Matthew then adds on to that with a, with a number of extra parables about being ready for the return of Jesus and being ready for the final judgment, uh, like the separating sheep uh, and the goats. And all this finally brings us to Matthew's passion narrative. Right? And... Uh, Matthew adds an, an extra passion prediction, a fourth passion prediction at the beginning of his passion narrative. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to the disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming, the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Right? And uh, this is now kind of the material from Mark 14 to 16. And as we've already seen, Matthew follows uh, Mark very closely in his his passion narrative so everything here and the anointing of jesus judas betraying the passover um jesus in gethsemane the, the various arrests and trials uh the crucifixion um and uh, and jesus death curtain being torn buried and then the resurrection narrative uh it's all very similar almost identical um, to Mark's gospel, except for Matthew's a few little additions that he makes. And remember what the, what the additions are? Uh, he adds a, a few things here. The first one is he adds how Judas changed his mind and returned the money, three to ten, 27, 3 to 10. He adds in about the earthquake, uh, the opening of the tombs as Jesus dies in 27, 50, 
51 and 52. And of course, he adds all the stuff about the uh, the posting of the guard, uh, and uh, and then you know the, the how the how the guards were bribed to spread this lie that Jesus' body was stolen during the night while they were while they were sleeping. All that is 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 added in, um, and then of course Matthew finishes um, very appropriately with uh, with the Great Commission: Go and make make disciples. Matthew, whose name means disciple. Matthew, whose gospel has been all about discipleship, ends by saying, go and make disciples in, in, in all the nations. So, yeah, that's, that, that's Matthew's gospel. And uh, I, I guess what, what I want you to take away from this is, is not just say, oh, look, it's just another, it's just another variant of, of Mark. You know, I guess with COVID, right, you have all these different variants, Omicron, Delta, and all this, and it's essentially the same virus, comes in a slightly different form. Well, Matthew retains the, the basics of what Mark is trying to do. Same structure, same basic goal, um, but he makes it his own. He adds his own material. He adds his own emphasis. Um, yeah, in, in a beautiful way. And so it's worth studying the gospel of Matthew on its own terms, right? Um, and not just say, oh, I've studied Mark. Most of it's in Matthew and I've kind of covered Matthew. No, studying, it's worth it to study Matthew. Um, yeah, on, on, on its own terms, yeah. Okay, there was our 28 minutes plus a bit of injury time, extra time <laughs> uh, to go through. Uh, Matthew's Gospel. Let me pause there. Any questions you want to ask before we go off for a break? Sorry, Tim. Um, could we read anything into what Matthew adds in on top of what Mark's put in, especially on the details? Would there be something to read out of it? Yeah, that's that's how you detect someone's unique emphasis, isn't it? By so that's why it helps to know that Mark wrote first because Matthew's writing with Mark in front of him. Then, okay, if he follows Mark, then that's not particularly significant, but it's where he differs from Mark. Um, then you know that, okay, this is reflecting something of Matthew's emphasis. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also thinking in the part where Matthew is actually an eyewitness. That means he himself was there. Yeah, when all this, whereas Mark is, if I understand correctly, is writing of what he actually, uh, I don't know how much of Mark eyewitness was, probably a young man, uh, but he's writing out of Peter's uh, so called eyewitness. So, therefore, I think Matthew would have more details than Mark could have. I'm not sure, I'm just reading. Uh, so I was just thinking whether would there be any significance of what Matthew was adding on into, uh, perhaps for his Jewish audience. Yeah, yeah. So as I said, as you see the where it differs, that that that's going to show you where uh, something. That's where you will detect what his purpose is. Okay. Mm -hmm.